saying that the, to go back to the first batch of questions there, that uh, this recession was caused by the loss of carrying capacity. What I'm saying is that this recession has got to be different from previous recessions because it's occurring in a time when we've lost carrying capacity. And a recession in a time when you're facing a carrying capacity deficit is bound to have a different outcome from an earlier recession that occurred when we could still plausibly think of having a carrying capacity surplus. Uh, if, you, if you read um, Paul Krugman in the New York Times, uh, recently he was, well, he's in a number of columns, he's deplored the fact that uh, we didn't spend enough on the, uh, uh, what's it called? The <laughs> stimulus. Stimulus. stimulus program. <laughs> <laughs> I needed more of a stimulus to think of that term. <laughs> uh, he thinks that we needed a bigger stimulus and that we've made the same mistake that he thinks FDR made after the end of his first term when by that time people were urging him to get off of this deficit spending and so on. And so he did kind of retract a little bit. And he's suggesting that Obama today is facing the same predicament that FDR faced about 1937 beginning of his second term. Well, we're not in 1937 or 38 anymore. And so let's go to one more version of this. Now, that's 1938 there, the boundary between the white and the red under the curve there. To the left of that boundary, that's all the oil that Americans had ever extracted from underneath American territory from the beginning of the oil industry up to 1938. The part I've colored in red there is what we've extracted since then. And that's a hell of a lot of oil that we've pumped out of the ground. And we're on the downslope, as I say. We're not discovering new deposits anywhere near as fast as we're exhausting old deposits. And uh, so Obama trying to stimulate the economy doesn't face the opportunities for stimulating it that FDR faced back in 1937-38. Now, to enable you to visualize that quantitatively, think of a, an oil drum, you know, about this big around, about that tall, barrel of oil, 42 gallons. Now think of 10 of those lined up here. Now think of 10 <coughs> rows like that, 100. Now think of 10 of those 10 by 10 row blocks of oil barrels, 100. And then think of that 100 deep. Now th think of tenfold that, so that you've got a thousand by a thousand barrels of oil, that doesn't begin to be this much oil. Now, think of stacking up 1,000 by 1,000 blocks of 42 gallon barrels, a thousand high. Think of that great big cube block of oil barrels. Okay, now think of 180 of those cubes of blocks of a thousand by a thousand by a thousand. That's how much oil is under that red curve there. That's how much isn't in the ground anymore for us to go after because we've already got it out and used it up. Uh, that's where we are now. That's why some of the things that once were plausible aren't plausible anymore. So will ecological limits dif differently affect people in different parts of the world? And if so, what facts will <coughs> differentiate the impacts on these different people? And um, why can't we count on technological progress to save us from ecological disaster? Further ecological disaster. Different parts of the world will be affected differently by the ecological deficit that the world now confronts because different parts of the world are using their local part of the world differently. Now the terminology that we've invented to refer to these different parts of the world has not really been adequate. When I was a kid first studying history as a grade schooler and then in high school, we talked about the advanced countries and the backward countries. Later we outgrew that ethnocentric uh, language and we started talking about developed and underdeveloped countries. 
Then we decided that even underdeveloped was kind of a stigma that was not quite proper. And so we started talking about developed and developing countries. What we really should have been talking about was countries that are populated by Homo Colossus, that is the <coughs> technologically advanced, uh, fossil fuel ravenous, non-renewable resource ravenous countries, and the countries that haven't yet committed themselves nearly so fully to depending upon exhaustible resources. That's the real difference. And if you divide the world into countries that are on one side of a development line and those that are on another side of a development line, obviously they will be affected differently. But the assumption that we tend to make on our side of the line that we are going to survive the problems that come better than the people on the wrong side of the line may be exactly the reverse of the truth. It may very well be that the countries that have not yet committed themselves to a ravenous use of non-renewable resources will end up better off in the long run than those of us that have made that advance. Now, I think you were about going to ask me next well, that there's a way out of this. <laughs> um, well, is there a way out of this? <laughs> <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> Let me uh, suggest, this may be a little bit fanciful. My favorite sentence in the English language, I told you a few minutes ago that I was glad to have been born in the English-speaking world because of the sad acronym there. Uh, it doesn't work in other languages. I found that even the word overshoot doesn't occur in other languages. Uh, overshoot has been translated into Russian and recently a Spanish language edition has come out and neither language had the equivalent to the word overshoot. I don't know what the word was in uh, Russian that they may do with it, but they talked about the, the collapse of the techno economy or something like that. And uh, the Spanish word is uh, rebosados which I guess simply means excesses. Uh, well, that's pretty close to overshoot. We, we did have a chance to see that this was the problem a long time ago. Uh, my favorite sentence in the English language is the last sentence on this bronze plaque. Most of you can't read it because it's down the bottom here. Uh, this is a plaque commemorating the first director of the National Park Service, Stephen Ting Mather who the Park Service was founded in 1916, and he's, there's a plaque like this in every one of our national parks, and it says at the bottom there, he laid the foundation of the National Park Service, defining and establishing the policies under which its areas shall be developed and conserved unimpaired for future generations. That's the key idea, conserved unimpaired for future generations. That's awfully close to recognizing the carrying capacity concept. Then my favorite sentence, there will never come an end to the good that he has done. I hope that's true. Uh, <coughs> what a fantastic sentence that is. There's only one word of more than one syllable in it. There will never come, and never is the two syllable word, never come an end to the good that he has done. Recently, I've begun wondering, there will never come an end to the harm that some people have done. Uh, and not that I'm saying that we could make the whole world a national park, but we needed to approach our use of the planet in somewhat the same mood as we were approaching, as he was approaching the national parks. We wanted to preserve them unimpaired for future generations. And I would hope that my uh, great-grandsons, two of whom I have, <laughs> uh, are going to have a world that they can still <coughs> enjoy, but uh, it's not going to be the same world in which I was a little kid. So did you want to use that as the end, or did you want to go with the last question? <coughs> that sort of answers in some ways. Is it possible that humanity's future has been irreparably damaged? Well, it may be. And in terms of what this conference is about, where we're trying to mount a real protest movement to just bring to a halt the devastation that we've been committing on this planet, I think we've got to remember what a multidimensional uh, onslaught 
it has been. There are three aspects to it, and just tackling any one of them isn't going to do the job. Somehow, we have got to end population growth because there's too many of us already. Even if we weren't using it as on a per capita ravenous basis as much as we are. We've also got to stop our technological enlargement of the per capita appetites for the stuff that the planet consists of. And then we've got to recognize the fact that we have extended our impact. We no longer, when I drive my car and emit CO2 into the atmosphere, or when I breathe and emit a little bit of CO2 into the atmosphere, it isn't just the atmosphere over me that is going to change in such a way that it no longer does the protection that I need from uh, carcinogenic uh, ultraviolet rays. It's the atmosphere over the whole world. We've, been, we've, we've extended our impact on the planet. We don't, we're no longer just local beings. So we've got all three of those things. That has diminished our independence. And so even though we are kind of impelled by the fact that we all have a job, we hope, <laughs> and we have to earn an income and so on, we're impelled to give priority to our own individual needs regardless of the planet. We can no longer get away with doing that. Uh, life is not that simple anymore. But what worries me is that we may, in our quest to devise a way of stopping all three of those development processes, we may become misanthropes. And so I'd like to go back to the thoughts of uh, an English clergyman several centuries ago, John Donne, who said, no man is an island, every man is a piece of a continent. And please remember, in those days, <coughs> men, men, men and women. <laughs> All humans are pieces <coughs> of humanity. And what we need to worry about is, can we change humanity's aspirations to make them less habitat destructive without ourselves becoming misanthropic in the process? Uh, we need a sense of modesty. Uh, to go back to the National Park example, let me conclude again with a nice motto. Uh, I think maybe it's the Wilderness Society that has come up with this. But uh, when you enter a national park, leave only, take only pictures. Don't take the stuff out of the park. Take only pictures, leave only footprints. Somehow we need the equivalent of that motto in our approach to life on this planet. five minutes um, for a pee break or um, to have him sign his book or whatever and then we'll be back in a couple minutes. <clears throat> I'm I mean, I worry so much. In this case, it was... <laughs>